Okay, so my name is Annalise Singh. I use she and they pronouns. I serve as Tulane's Chief Diversity Officer, and I'm kind of pinching myself right now that I'm sitting with these two incredible scholars and change agents. Uh, and thank you all for being here. Are you enjoying the New Orleans Book Fest? Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you to all the volunteers, the tech folks. It's been an incredible, last night was incredible, and today has been uh, so nourishing. Um, so I'm going to read some bios just very briefly. I know this can be awkward for y'all, but I think it's important important <laughs> that we know what these people have done. Um, so Heather McGee, who if you don't know, she's going to be at our anti-racism and EDI teach-in as our national keynote scholar on March 24th, so she'll be back with us, um, designs and promotes solutions to inequality in America. Over her career in public policy, Heather has crafted legislation, testified before Congress, and helped shape presidential campaign platforms. Her book, how many people have it? <laughs> the sum of us, look at that. Yeah. It's so good. Um, profile, spent 10 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list and was long listed for the National Book Award and the Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Nonfiction. The New York Times called it, this is so true, the book that would change how progressives talk about race. And the Chicago Tribune said, required reading to move the country forward. It's a Washington Post and Time Magazine must-read book of 2021. Heather's an educator serving currently as a visiting lecturer in urban studies at the City University of New York School of Labor and Urban Studies. She has held visiting positions in, at Yale University's Brady Johnson Grand Strategy Program and the University of Chicago's Institute of Politics. Let's give her a warm round of applause. Welcome to New Orleans. We're thrilled you're here. And uh, I know not to call you the G word, Hoove. <laughs> Do I call you Dr. Hoove? Never. <laughs> okay, I figured, but I just wanted to get that out of the way. Hoove is the executive director of the Murphy Institute, and we have Miss Murphy in the house. Can we give her a round of applause, too? Thank you for being here. Um, where he's a professor of economics and an affiliate professor of law. From 2015 until 2020, he was a President's Associate's Presidential Professor and the Chair of Economics Department at the University of Oklahoma, who received his PhD in economics from Washington University in St. Louis in 1998. Since then, he's published numerous scholarly research papers, book chapters, and reviews on topics concerning income redistribution, poverty, political economy, and ethics in the economics profession. Let's give Hoove a round of applause. Okay. This truly is a dream come true for me to sit with you all because I think, um, you know, when we think about uh, racism, systemic racism in the land we now call the United States of America, you know, it has been this kind of zero sum game that you talk about, Heather. And you wrote this powerful book where you talk about zero sum theory. Can you share why you wrote this book and what zero sum theory is? Yeah, sure. Well, first of all, let me just add um, my appreciation to the incredible organizers and volunteers uh, here at the Book Fest. I love book festivals <laughs> because I love book people, and um, it's just wonderful to be among you, uh, and of course to Tulane for hosting. Um, I wrote The Sum of Us out of frustration because I'd been a policy wonk working at a think tank uh, focused on solutions to inequality, and I realized that it wasn't going to be another white paper or another congressional testimony or media appearance that was going to finally convince the people in power to make better decisions in our collective economic self-interest, that in fact we knew what the solutions were, we just weren't able to come together to fight for them and win them. And so I had a lot of questions about what was really holding us back from, as I say in the opening line of the book, um, not being able to have nice things, uh, not like flying cars, but universal health care and <laughs> child care and paid family leave. Um, and so I hit the road, and I hit the road literally. I don't know how many miles. Um, at one point during the height of the pandemic, I took my infant son and my husband in an RV to, to complete the research. Um, but I also was intellectually really looking at different fields than I'd been trained in in law and economics. I was looking at the social sciences and sociology and political science. And, and that was there that I came upon this whole body of research that really named that uh, there's a predominant worldview in the US that says that there's sort of a fixed pie of well-being. And if one group gets a bigger slice, the other groups have to get smaller slices. And it's a racialized worldview uh, because it's like racial and ethnic groups that are competing with one another for status and dominance and belonging. 
and it's a particularly racialized worldview because white Americans are more likely to view the world through this zero-sum prism. Of course, the zero-sum game is when there's no mutual progress. If one team scores a point, the other team loses a point. And that's not how I had been trained to see the economy, right? I'd been trained to see the economy as we want all of our players on the field scoring points for our team. Inequality is actually a drag on economic growth. Um, but the zero-sum story tells us we're not all on the same team. And so, in many ways, that was a launching point for really understanding in a new way the role that racial consciousness and the stories that we are told about who we are and who we are to one another plays in mediating um, facts, mediating you know, political coalitions, mediating our responses to rising inequality in you know, the great era of inequality. And you talk about drain pool politics. Can you talk about that? Because in 1962, our, the largest pool at Audubon, Audubon pool was drained for seven years mm -hmm. yep. as opposed to like moving forward with mm -hmm. integration. So That's can you right. talk a little bit about that? That's right. It's been a very interesting um, thing when I'm out in the world uh, visiting different audiences and talking about the book because inevitably someone will have a pool story from that state, right? And it's not just in the South, believe you me. Um, I have this like former organizers and educators thing of being like, there are some empty seats here in the middle. So if you want to, before we get like into full swing, just go ahead and find them. And there's them some in the front okay. as well. Yeah, don't worry about interrupting us. It's annoying to not be able to sit for a four or five minute talk. Yes. Um, um, so, um, you know, there were lots of nods, um, obviously, in the description of the literal drained pool, right? So we used to have all across the country, nearly 2,000 lavishly funded grand resort style public swimming pools that were part of a building boom of public goods in the 30s and 40s. And most of them were segregated either, you know, as part of a Jim Crow code or just by custom uh, and enforced through intimidation and violence like it was in Chicago when I was growing up, right? Um, and, um, for me, when I realized the extent of the pool draining in our society, where so many towns and cities opted to drain their public pools rather than integrate them. Uh, in Montgomery, Alabama, Oak Park Pool was uh, one of the biggest ones in the South, and um, the, Montgomery, the city of Montgomery decided to close its entire Parks and Recreation Department rather than integrate its recreation codes, and they kept it closed for a decade. So from 59 to 69, there was no, there were no parks, mm -hmm. right? They were all closed, there were no recreation centers, they sold off the animals in the zoo, right? All to avoid integration. And as part of my intellectual journey and the conversations that I was having for the writing of The Sum of Us, I really wanted to practice kind of a radical empathy not because I wanted to be kind to a bunch of people, because I really wanted to understand, right? I wanted to understand, well, what would cause someone who had loved this public good that they could access for free to say, you know what, I'd rather go without it than be on equal footing as and share that water with someone that I'd been taught to disdain and distrust. And then being able to use that as a metaphor for really unlocking what happened to the New Deal economic social contract, right? Because of course those public goods weren't just pools and schools and libraries and roads and bridges, right? They were social security and a massive investment in housing and the GI Bill and the commitment to affordable college and all of that that was drained as well as in the wake of the civil rights movement we began to see a new sort of economic common sense that moved a lot of things from the sort of arena of the public good to a private cost. Um, and a private luxury. And so I liken uh, what happened to the drained pools, literally, to the drained pool politics and healthcare and the cost of college and our inability to come together and have a multiracial uh, coalition that will support a strong role for government in addressing climate change and all these things that require collective action, the, the weakness of labor unions and all of that, really seeing how it is racist beliefs that when sold and marketed and attached to public policy positions by elites who are profiting from the sale of those political stories end up costing everyone. And so that's really the, 
the kind of you know, broad point is that, of course, not equally, but racism in our politics and our policy making can have a cost for almost everyone except the very wealthy and self-interested elite. And we'll talk about the history of how that all came to be in a moment, but you talk about this as the beginning of the inequality era. Mm -hmm. So, Hoove, your scholarship has also investigated the intersections of economics, race, and public policy, such as income redistribution, poverty, political economy, ethics, and the econ ec economics profession. What have you learned from studying those intersections? Well, the interesting thing that I find is that only in this particular policy area would this be allowed. So let's say that it is true. Let's start from the premise that this group is simply not capable of using the economic system as it exists, right? Then what you're saying is that you've got, there's something unique to this group that's making them not be able to use this system, the economic system with all that is provided, and we might call that user error. In any other business, if you had 14% user error, you'd think about either redesign or a product recall. Yet, And who's the them you're talking about? Well, any, particularly we're talking on racial lines, yeah. right? But we don't have to. We could yeah. say more so. OK, um, poverty affects 37 million Americans, right? Of which we are disproportionately talking about black and brown people. Yeah. If that's true and you've got 37 million people who don't know how to use your product, as you said, the problem isn't that the system is inherently structurally flawed, but that these people just don't know how to use the system in its grandness, then you would say, okay, then there's something wrong. Just imagine if one in five people every day drove into a bridge. We'd do something. We would say that there's something wrong with the on-ramp, <laughs> and we need to think about maybe putting up new signage, mm -hmm. or maybe redesigning the on-ramp itself, yeah. as opposed to saying, well, clearly those people are inferior, mm -hmm. and they don't know how to use this system as it exists. So then what does that mean? That must mean that there's something structurally amiss here, right? And the construct being that these people are inherently unsophisticated and unable to take advantage, as opposed to being able to say, you know what, we need to think about maybe some type of redesign, or that structurally they've been kept from attaining the same wealth that others have. So there's a reason we don't act and we don't create those policies. And it brings me to my question for you, Heather, like how did we get here to this mm -hmm. inequality era? Because some would say it's been unequal since the beginning of time, but yeah. can you talk about those roots of our country? Well, the economy is not the weather, right? It doesn't just happen rules that powerful people set, hopefully accountable in a democratic system, powerful people set, are what shape opportunity and outcomes. And so, yes, the original economic model of the U.S. was a vastly unequal and immoral one, right? Stolen land, stolen people, stolen labor. You don't get more exploitative and unequal than that. Um, and yet we have had periods of compression, right? It's such a like, weird economic term, <laughs> compression. It's like, uh-oh, <laughs> like we're being squeezed. No, but like, right, an income compression um, where it hasn't been diverging but actually um, the income quintiles, for example, have been growing uh, sort of in a more equitable way. And that period of time in the 20th century was the period in the wake of the Great Depression and the 1940s, the New Deal era of public goods. And so I listed those economic public goods, right? The Social Security and the massive investment in housing. And um, on top of that, a really heretofore unprecedented investment in mass home ownership through a subsidized, regulated um, uh, financial instrument called the mortgage, uh, and all and the labor laws of the New Deal era, and all of that worked effectively to create the greatest middle class the world had ever seen. And every public good I just described was in one way or another, like the pools, exclusionary. 
right? Either Social Security, which excluded the two job categories that most black workers were in, mm -hmm. domestic work and agricultural work in a compromise with the Southern delegation to Congress, or the massive investment in housing that this progressive FDR New Deal government made and based it on the never substantiated assumption that black people would be too much of a credit risk. Mm -hmm. And so surveyed the all of the biggest metro areas in the country uh, down to the block level for their racial and ethnic character and basically barred private lending from those areas. Um, massive subsidies to private developers to create the housing stock, much of which we still live in, uh, on the condition of subsidy that it would only go to people wholly of the Caucasian race, not just in the South, but across the country, right? And so you began to see the ways and even the labor laws when we had unions excluding people by race, and there was what widespread job discrimination. The GI Bill was race neutral on its face, mm -hmm. but the benefits were in segregated housing and education sectors, right? So you had these sort of segregated economic pool, and it really was a coincidence of the demands by black families and their eventual allies in some parts of organized labor to say, you know, this is not fair, first of all, it's been black tax dollars that have been funding these public goods too all along, but also, um, you know, this nation's prosperity should be open to all those who've contributed to it. And it was really that promise that was made in the 1960s in the era of civil rights that really tested the New Deal coalition, where white Americans who had been taught that there was something terribly wrong uh, with people of color, and particularly black folks, um, were then told by that same government that had been printing the maps and the whites only signs, right, that, you know, oh no, we were wrong, we actually are going to live up to our founding rhetoric and uh, we are all equal. And in many ways that was seen by the majority of white voters at that time as a betrayal by the government. And so we saw in the public opinion data a massive shift away from supporting the idea of public goods among the majority of white voters. And there's a statistic in the book where I talk about um, a guaranteed income below which no family should fall and a federal job guarantee, right? The idea of like, if you can't find a job in the private sector that's a good job, you can you know, go to a federal job office and get a job doing something for the good of your country. These are pretty radical socialist ideas in mm -hmm. today's politics, but they were popular with 70% of white Americans in 1956 and 1960. But by 1964, that share of white voters who supported those kind of robust economic public goods or guarantees um, had fallen nearly in half. And so I'm looking at this data and I'm thinking, well, what is happening between 1960 and 1964? Right. Well, <laughs> the March on Washington, which is for jobs and freedom, yes. and actually a federal job guarantee and a national living wage are part of the two core demands, right? There weren't actually that many demands, and those were two of them. And 63 was, of course, the year that President Kennedy went on a media blitz around civil rights, firmly associating his party, the party of the New Deal, with civil rights. And then we know that, of course, his successor, Lyndon Johnson, would, after making good on those promises with the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act, um, become the last Democrat, Johnson would, running for president to win the majority of white voters to this day. And that is a, a history that not only tells us about racism, but it also tells us about the economic history of a political shift that then went to supporting an entirely different economic agenda that has ultimately created far higher levels of concentration of wealth, but on the backs of a cultural marketing and a racial marketing that keeps, I don't like to say that keeps white people voting against their self-interest because I think their self-interest, mm -hmm. people believe, when people tell you what their self-interest is, you believe them, right? You know, who am I to say what folks' self-interest is? Um, but it does keep, um, it has kept a, a majority white coalition for an economic ideology that has, you know, led to 37 million people being in mm -hmm. poverty, the majority of whom are white, right? Not disproportionate, but the majority of whom are white. 
When you talk about kind of the, what's happened to the middle class with kind of a, the metaphor of a football versus a bow tie, mm -hmm. can you comment yeah. on that? Yeah, so I don't like PowerPoint, so I'm often, you know, out in audiences trying to use like hand things to, to show, you know, what I, in the beginning of my career, was using like 50 point slides for, um, 50, 50 slide charts and graphs for. So I talk about how, um, you know, in the era of shared prosperity, uh, in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, um, we had an economy that was shaped like a football with a fat middle class in the middle and, and narrower ends of high and low income households. And then in the 70s, 80s through today, we have more of an economy that's shaped like a bow tie, right? With a squeezed middle class and bulging ends of high and low income households. I don't know if that passes muster with the good professor, but <laughs> it usually helps lay folks, you know, really understand, Thumbs you know, up. something that they experience <laughs> as well, right? They, that we all know that it used to be easier um, to have uh, the hallmarks of a middle class life, even um, for many families of color, but we can talk about that nuance. When it goes back to your question about can, why can't we have good things, nice mm -hmm. things, and I think Hoove was nodding his approval at your uh, metaphor, <laughs> but you know, in her book she talks about how you know, as a result of the public goods falling out of favor with white folks, right? White folks then become the most segregated group in the country. And can you bring this home to New Orleans for us, who how New Orleans is also segregated by race and class. What is the cost of segregation for us? And how can public policy address the long-term effects of white supremacy, anti-black racism, and indigenous erasure? Just a small question for you. <laughs> right. Well, <laughs> okay, well, I'll give you a small answer then. I'll give you, I'll give you a short answer. Look. No economy or no organization can work effectively with that much human capital, people, productive people sitting on the sidelines. Mm -hmm. And so what you end up doing is you end up seeing everyone hurt, right? Because the overall economy isn't functioning as it was designed. It was designed to have everyone fully engaged. The problem is that if you think about it, people would say, I don't want to have, white people could say, I don't want to have government programs that support these black people given that I did it on my own. So there, there doesn't need to be any overt programs to help these people because there are no overt outward facing programs that help me where I would argue that those are systemic, those are built in, the things that helped you were already built into the system and so you didn't see overt helping. Mm -hmm. However, I would never deny the claim that these folks also worked hard. They say, look, mm -hmm. you know, I worked hard. And if you were to say to them, is it possible that you worked hard and you benefited from mm -hmm. a system that was designed in your favor, they'd say no. Mm -hmm. So which one will I give up on, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Will I give up on the idea that I worked hard? No, I'm gonna give up on the idea that the system was inherently biased in my favor. That, in and of itself, makes for a, 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 a disconnect that will not allow us to move forward if I don't understand that if I'm selling washing machines, black people buy washing machines too. Yeah. So what I would want to do is have a fully engaged economy where everyone could buy my stuff, mm -hmm. right? So the more people buying my stuff, the better off I am. So going back to this analogy of the pie in the zero sum game, right? If we have a fixed pie and a larger slice goes to black people, then inherently that does mean that a smaller slice will go to me. But let's do this. Let's grow the pie. Can we bake more pie? Yeah. <laughs> can, we, can we just simply make the pie bigger? Yeah. And you know how we do that? By engaging this productive human capital. Econ talk, meaning these people who can people. actually <laughs> engage in the workforce. I'm a counseling psychologist. I'm learning right now. Right. So, so thank you. <laughs> I, I think that's where the disconnect happens. Now, take that down one step to here in New Orleans. Mm. Um, we got a lot of productive human capital. In fact, too much productive human capital sitting on the sideline. And then we wonder why it is that New Orleans in particular hasn't reached its fullest potential. 
And all you have to do is take a look at those not engaged in the system. How in the world were you expecting it to be? And I go back to my analogy before about this whole thing with um, you know, user error. How were you expecting this machine to work properly when you've made the system such that 54%, because that's how many black people, you know, the percentage of black people in New Orleans are sitting on the sideline, unproductive in what you consider to be the economic system that you created. It just, it, it was never going to work. When it sounds like we need to get creative, you talked about guaranteed income. There have been some of those programs in New Orleans with young people that seem to be working. They give $500 a month during the summer, and you know what young people in New Orleans do? They save the money, <laughs> they invest it, um, they're thinking about college. Um, Can I just you, say yeah. one mm -hmm. other thing? Um, I just, I, I do, I always want to make sure that um, we, are, we are both talking about the flaws in the system that need to be corrected and we are reminding ourselves and everyone that, you know, black resilience and black productivity and black innovation and creativity has powered some of the most important American breakthroughs yes. in our economy and our society, right? Um, so both things are true. And so, to exactly your point, Dr. Hoover, we have this, um, is that okay? I think it's Hoove. <laughs> um, we're not on that basis yet, we just met. <laughs> he put you on that basis the moment he meets you. It's very well, interesting. very kind Hoove. of him, but. Um, so, um, you know, think about right now the, you know, one of the most jarring, um, impacts of the intergenerational racial wealth divide, right? So we talked about how black families were legally barred from being part of the subsidized, mainstream, affordable, vanilla um, mortgage market uh, for most of the 20th century. And then after about 10 years, uh, then we had reverse redlining and subprime lending and all of that, which I go into in the book. But so what we have is a massive home ownership gap and a massive, um, um, you know, home equity gap, and therefore, you know, this huge racial wealth divide. And as we know, wealth is where history shows up in your wallet, right? And so, this debate that we are having right now about what we have thought of for the past 40 years, as it's been ratcheting up, this crisis of the underfunding of public college and the shift from grants to loans in the student debt crisis, um, we've t thought of it as sort of just this race neutral thing where we just, we just did this for everybody, right? Tuition went up for everybody and this is just what we're doing now. We're experimenting with debt as the way to pay for college. Um, but ultimately where we've ended up is that a black college graduate, of which there are many, <laughs> has less wealth, household wealth, than a white high school dropout. Yeah on average, yeah. right? So a white high school dropout has more wealth, right? Not income, not a paycheck, but something they've inherited, home equity, stocks and bonds, et cetera, right? Than a black college graduate. And so when we have debates today in our politics about canceling, I don't like to say forgiving, as if somebody's done something yes. wrong yes. by doing exactly <laughs> what society told them to do, canceling, Ten or twenty thousand dollars of student debt, and uh, you know, two weeks ago we had the Supreme Court oral arguments about this um, uh, lawsuit to to stop it, to stop the program, to cancel this debt. And one of the conservative justices said, "Well, it's not fair. Total zero sum argument. Um, what about a small business owner who had a lawn care business? They don't get to have and took out a loan. They don't get to have." loan cancellation. Now, putting aside the hundreds of billions of dollars in PPP loans that yeah. were free money and that the we wider went affirmative to corporate, action that was right, that we yeah. went out to corporations just like that, right? Mm -hmm. um, putting aside the fact that actually, if that small business owner's business goes belly up, they can walk away from it in bankruptcy and student loans are not dischargeable in bankruptcy, right? So putting aside that he's wrong to say those two things, that those debts are not um, that there's no sort of loan relief for, for that small business owner. Thinking to your point, Dr. Hoover, about the interrelatedness of our economy, now what does a small business owner who's got a lawn care business really want more of? Homeowners. 
right? Student loan debt is a significant drag on home ownership. Right, so what is this weird, mean, resentful, zero-sum world that occupies these folks' brains where I would rather torpedo something that's gonna give $20,000 back to every, you know, the most ready to buy a home, the most ready to start a business people in my state, in every state in this country. We had 25 million people sign up within a month for that loan relief, right? And why would I see that as something that I want to go to the courts to stop? It just makes no sense. It's such self-sabotage. I appreciate you. Yeah. Uh, you know that emoji in your phone where your brain is blowing <laughs> off? Like, that's what I feel like anytime I sit with you. And you as well, Hoove. Okay, last question, and then you all know we want to get your questions on these mics in the aisles. Uh, so, Heather, you coined the phrase solidarity dividend, and I want to read... Uh, a just brief couple sentences from your book. This is page 65 in a chapter called Going Without. The kind of cross-racial public investment could be a new governing ethos for America, a country that has always linked what we give to who you are. History, what did you say? Wealth is history in your wallet? Wow. Um, as we become a nation with no racial majority, we will need more of this spirit to create a new basis for investing in ourselves broadly and without prejudice. And I know your mom is a part of you know, some of your ideas for the solidarity mm -hmm. uh, dividend. Mm -hmm. What is the solidarity dividend? Why do we need it? So, um, you know, I'm a big believer in like trying to come up with sticky phrases. Um, to do the other part of communication, which is not just saying things, but having people listen and think about them and all of that. And so as I was um, mired in negative stories about our history and the economic cost, I said, well, this book has got to have some hope, and I personally need to find some hope. And then I did begin to see all of these stories of the opposite of the zero sum, people refilling the pool of public goods together. And so I wanted a term for that. And I wanted a term that economists and business people would flash to, right? Because, um, you know, they're a part of the coalition that needs to be on board with attacking, uh, with fixing the system. And so the idea of a solidarity dividend is a gain, like a real tangible gain that can be unlocked, but only through collective action that is multiracial. And it's basically saying that when we recognize that there are common solutions to our common problems, um, then we can have the kind of people power that it takes to overcome powerful interests that want to keep us divided and want to keep wealth concentrated. And so the book includes a bunch of stories of solidarity dividends, and then I actually last year went out on the road again um, because when you meet Americans through something other than your phone or your screen, <laughs> it's really nice and they're yes. much better than they are in your you know, news media and social media, I promise you. Um, so I went out on the road again for an audio documentary, people call it a podcast, um, that was just focused on telling stories of solidarity dividends. So a multiracial coalition in Memphis that blocked an oil pipeline that threatened the city's water and the historically black community. Um, a multiracial coalition that helped get an African um, farm cooperative off the ground to save small farming in rural Maine, right? Like all of these examples of coalitions realizing that it is in their collective self-interest to address something that is broken and something that has usually been broken by some vestige of racism. Um, and then my, my mom, Dr. Gail Who Christopher. Who is amazing, is, by the is, way. I'm very, very fortunate. Um, her name is Dr. Gail Christopher, and she uh, created a framework called the Truth, Racial Healing, and Transformation, um, which there is one here in New Orleans mm -hmm. as well as in um, dozens of other places to really get stakeholders to come together to address their racial history, to heal, and to transform. Awesome, thank you. Okay, we are ready for your questions. So the mics are in both aisles. I have a feeling we're gonna have a lot. We'll we've, let us know if the question is for Heather and or Hoove, uh, and we'll go right here. Hello. If you could let us know your name, your pronouns, that would be great. Hi, Jenny Espinoza, she, her, hers. So as I'm sure you both are familiar with, there's a huge body, of literature and data showing that upstream investments, especially during early childhood, in particular for families, mm -hmm. 
have the highest return on investment mm -hmm. of any type of spending, ultimately would reduce the deficit through increased tax revenue, decreased spending in social programs, in mass incarceration, and so forth. And of course, this would benefit mostly low, lower income persons who disproportionately are black and brown. And I'm just curious why don't people talk about this more? <laughs> it's so compelling. Like just, yeah. And uh, so whenever I bring it up, people are kind of surprised by this. And I'm just curious why yeah. don't we all know this? Yeah, really good question. Thank you. Awesome. Um, you know, it's really important. It's, um, as I looked at kind of the nice things that we don't have because of racism in our politics, um, I actually didn't even realize the degree to which racism stopped the universal child care proposal that happened in the 70s under Nixon. Because it was seen that if we had all these big early childhood centers across the country, they would be like another front for integration, right? That was what the um, conservatives in his party um, fought. And, you know, it has to do with gender politics and, and all of that. Um, it's, it's a really smart investment. Um, in fact, it's been much more mainstreamed under this administration. The, um, I don't know if anyone saw it other than me, but I was, did a little happy dance. The money that is going to the semiconductor and other technolo technology infrastructure um, companies uh, from the CHIPS Act um, as part of the sort of renewal of American manufacturing. You know, manufacturing jobs are highest than they've been since the 70s. Like, this is a huge shift in the American economy, right? Um, are conditioned on the employers offering affordable childcare. That's huge, right? That's really huge. Uh, hey, I just want to say thank y'all. Um, I'm a PhD candidate in urban studies, actually. I'm at the very end of my dissertation. Congratulations. One more month left. <laughs> yes. Uh, thanks. Um, so my dissertation is the history of New Orleans East. I know you're not from here, but that's where the black middle class in New Orleans lives. Uh -huh. um, I've done extensive interview archives. A lot of critical race theory, uh -huh. um, which interest convergence is really uh -huh. kind of like the met sum uh -huh. game. Anyway, I'm using today as kind of like inspirational thinking for my last chapter because I, mean, oh, I am at the cool. end. That's awesome. You made me think of something. I just want to share this real quick, your thoughts. I was talking with my friend the other day about the in every city's facing this, the homeless encampments along the interstates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we were texting about this yesterday, actually, and I said, you know, I'm finished my dissertation, you know, I'm all, about, I'm all about nuance, but sometimes I really just sit here and I think to myself, and I'm grossly oversimplifying here, <laughs> why can't the appeal to conservatives be that we should fix homelessness simply because we know that they don't like looking at it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's fix this simply because you don't have to look at it, which we all know you hate looking. Yeah, yeah. And her response to me was, they hate helping the poor more than they hate looking at them. Mm -hmm. That's all I want to say. So okay, thank good. you again. You're inspiring me to complete my dissertation. You. But you Congratulations. Give me a lot to, you give me a lot to think about. So thank, thank you. Thank you. I'm Daniel. He, him. Uh, question for Heather. Um, like you, I'm very much in favor of nice things. <laughs> um, very strongly pro-nice things. Um, but I've noticed it, when they're implemented in American cities, yeah. given our um, racial disparities, economic disparities, uh, certain problems arise, whether it's like the High Line in New York City, the Northeast, um, D.C., trolley line, um, streetcar lines here, mm -hmm. removing highways, all kinds mm -hmm. of things. Mm -hmm. um, what often happens is kind of wave of gentrification follows. Yeah. The people for whom the amenity was being added get pushed out. Yeah. Um, and now, to the extent we try to add new amenities, uh, you have a kind of pre-debate about who benefits and mm -hmm. often paralyzing in, in the case of the city. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. what are the types of things we can do to kind of sell yeah. everybody and truly have everyone benefit from these good things? Yeah. Um, thank you for your question. Uh, it's a really good one. And I think this is where you really see where um, when you have development in a context of, you know, rem um, enduring, often unconscious, often not, often with an economic justification instead of a racial justification, you know, racist and biased views, you're just ending up exacerbating the problem. Um, and I think, honestly, my, my radical answer is that, so I, I live in Brooklyn, New York, and in a neighborhood called Bed-Stuy, Bedford-Stuyvesant, yep. um, which is a very black neighborhood, um, but rapidly gentrifying. And 
when black people have wealth, communities don't gentrify when amenities come in, right? When there is widespread wealth, you can have a resistance to that because it doesn't, it, it's not, it doesn't mean that people with money who come in are able to displace people without money. And nothing is really going to address and build up black wealth other than addressing and building up black wealth and explicitly doing that. And we keep not doing it. We keep creating new ways to destroy black wealth like every 50 years in our history. Um, and so we need a robust agenda that is just focused on that. I want reparations for the 20th century exclusion in wealth building policy, right? Well, we've done reparations with different groups and you're reminding me, I think post reconstruction, black wealth was about 1%, now about what? Four percent. So when you think about that, even in our EDI efforts at the university, we talk about we've got to build black and BIPOC wealth here. That's mm -hmm. what these initiatives are about. Okay, we'll take your question uh, in the red, beautiful jacket. So, um, yeah, I guess my question is about, um, like, how do you even have these discussions in, like, the conscious, liberal, progressive spaces? Because mm -hmm. I find that I even have friends who, like, they're very they're choosy about what, what stores they go to, you know, making sure that they're buying ethically traded things. But then those same friends will then go into the heart of the community and buy a house that's overly priced. Mm -hmm. You know, I need to bring up the tax bracket. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, why is it that you can go out of your way to go to Trader Joe's? Mm -hmm. But then when it comes to it's like purchasing question. homes, mm -hmm. and even they'll buy a double. I, I'm not even gonna say this person was my friend. This person was a friend of Jason, but she let her dogs live on the other side <laughs> friend rather Jason. than rent it out. You know? Oh, wow. Don't get me wrong, she goes to protest, she has a black life. Right, matter, but right, you know, right, right. Oh, you know what I'm saying? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, yes, gosh, yes. that's a whole other panel, right? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Now, listen, there has never been a come up like white people buying homes in this country, right? The, the way that home ownership is begat by people having family members who've owned homes and having that wealth. And then the way that having a home has meant free money, it just, it's, it's, there's nothing else like it. There is nothing else like it. And so that is a really hard um, mentality to stop, right? The idea that of course I want to make as much money as possible um, on this thing and where can I buy low and sell high is the economically depressed, you know, strategically disinvested, formerly redlined communities. But and, they have to have that. Company. And leave this on their doorstep. There's a <laughs> podcast coming out. I'm going to really try to get to all three of these questions and who feel free to jump in as you want. We'll go here. So we're going to, we got yeah, three minutes. Do them all so we'll see. We'll, just a we'll quick see question. what we can do. Um, what are your thoughts on the two party system as a tool um, for the, uh, the ruling class to continue with the system that you guys mentioned? Great. Thank you. Um, I just had a question. Yes. Uh, okay. Um, my question. Thank you for coming. I'm just so happy to see you here. Um, I got a cool story too, but I won't share. Um, my question is: As I look into the future, my children want to work remotely. Um, there's a human capital. Mm -hmm. This is now a new opening for our entire population. But where does it? Have you looked at, or have you have you thought about how? This is going to uh, influence the racial mm -hmm. disparities. That's because mm -hmm. that's what we're looking at mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. That's like mm -hmm. in our face. Mm -hmm. So if you could speak to that, I'd be curious. Mm -hmm. um, uh, my name is DJ Johnson. I'm the owner of Baldwin and Company Bookstore here in New Orleans. Woo! <laughs> yeah! <laughs> um, uh, it literally comes at a high price. So the World Literacy Foundation they estimate that 1.5 trillion dollars are spent annually due to illiteracy. How can mm -hmm. we use literacy as a tool mm -hmm. to spur our national and global economy? Mm -hmm. right, thank you. And we're going to take three minutes to answer this question. We got some time. We're going to ignore that for okay. a second. Yeah. All right. All right. Do you want to start? Okay. Um, uh, the two-party system, yes. Um, in many states, there's something called fusion, which allows candidates, laws, allows third parties to endorse major party candidates 
and not spoil, right? Um, so like in New York, there's something called the Working Families Party, which you can be a Working Families Democrat or Working Families Republican, right? And it, and it has more of a, an agenda than just the broad two-party system. And I think it's really important that we move towards more of a sense of like parliamentary, because we're in a massive reshuffling of our political system right now. Um, uh, I think the remote work piece is huge for urban development. Um, interestingly, the people who are the least l happy to go back into the office are women and people of color. I mean, not that interesting, right? It was the, the office dynamics were made and set They've for They've been a certain free of group, some microaggressions, right? right? Uh, um, but I also think that it's hard to come up when you are only, for young people today who've never had any experience of being in the office, it, I think it's going to be difficult. Th this is something very, would be very interesting to study. I agree. No, it's your, it's your time. <laughs> yeah. no, I, uh, and then to, so I'm going right after this to Baldwin and Company Bookstore. I'm so excited. I'm going to um, sign books there as well as here. Um, I'm really excited. People have been talking about it. It's all the rage. Yes. Um, Oprah loves it. <laughs> Oprah I mean, loves it. Love Oprah. The New York Times loves yeah, it. Yeah, everyone loves um, it. Um, I think, so literacy is so important. I mean, obviously people, you know, our ancestors fought and died and, and were outlaws to learn to read. Um, and, I, and I think this is obviously a, a good room for, for the message that um, books are transformational. And obviously, you know, so right now, last week, the young readers version of The Sum of Us came out. It's for middle school and high school students. Yes. And so I've been going around the country talking to middle school and high school students about this stuff, and they don't need it dumbed down. They really don't. They need the sort of critical thinking and the storytelling and the provocation and the deep questions, and that's what makes reading come alive and makes it relevant to their lives. Okay, so follow Hoove at the Murphy Institute. Let's give him a round of applause. Heather McGee will be back with us on March 24th at 12 p.m. at the Anti-Racism and EDI Teach-In. Let's give them both a round of applause. The podcast is coming out when? The podcast is already here. It's, it's called here. The Sum of Us, and then I'm signing books now. And you're signing books right across the way, so we okay. can show you.